Uh, Philippe says, what are some of the jazz musicians that aren't saxophonists that you've lifted slash transcribed a lot from? Great question. <laughs> um, Miles Davis. <laughs> a lot of Miles Davis. Uh, some Lee Morgan. Um, a lot of Paul Chambers, actually. Philly Joe Jones. I transcribed two of his drum solos. Um, Brad Meldow is one of my favorite musicians of all time. I've been, like, boundlessly influenced by Brad. Um, I've listened to his old album so many times that, like, I've basically transcribed all of his stuff without having to actively transcribe it. Because that's that album, like, I, some of y'all know already, that album was used um, in as my background music for Gran Turismo 5. Because that's when they first allowed you to put your own music from the, the console as, like, racing or menu music. So I just put Brad Meldow's Ode as the menu music. So I'm just chilling there. I freaking, like, went in <laughs> and just did that. So that was my vibe. So Brad Meldow, another big one. I got to keep thinking. Um, Roy Hargrove, of course. Roy Hargrove was, like, my main reason for wanting to move to New York. I said I wanted to meet him and want to play with him. That was, so, you know, obviously rest in peace now. But luckily I got to at least play with him by proxy. Um, you know, I got to play with him in big bands and stuff like that. Like, Evan Sherman big band. Uh, where he was a soloist and so Roy was like a big inspiration for me so I transcribed so much Roy especially when I first got to go to a jam session with him because apparently I heard the story the story is like I was in um it was two people actually and it's really crazy that they're no longer here with us um rest in peace to both of these amazing people they've changed my life and I don't know where I would have been without them so about Roy Hargrove and Lawrence Leathers um low man Apparently, it was Lawrence Leathers that told Roy Hargrove about me when I was when I first came to New York when I was 18. Because I came there and I was going to the sessions every single freaking day. I busted my behind. If you want to learn jazz, y'all, you got to go out and meet people. You got to go out and play with people. Go to sessions, play as much as you possibly can. You can't get it just from looking at YouTube videos. And if this is on YouTube, you can't get it from just looking at this video either. <laughs> you know, you got to go out and play. But seriously, though, um... I was at Smalls, and I, because I, I knew where it was at, Evan, Evan Sherman, good friend of mine, he said, come out, Roy is here, I'm, I'm, you know I'm running. So I finally get to see him, and outside after the session, because, you know, back then Smalls would end at like four, and then Fat Cat would go till five. <laughs> so you would go, and you would just kind of, you would go to Smalls first, and then go to Fat Cat, or vice versa, whatever you felt like doing, but because Fat Cat was later, people usually went to go see what the vibe was at Smalls first, and then went to go to Fat Cat. Um, I'm talking about New York City, y'all. Um, and so I was outside of Smalls, and then Roy Hargrove walked out. And I was like, dang, you know, like in my head. So I just introduced myself, and I was, you know, just like, hey, you know, nice to meet you. And then uh, Roy said, hey, you that, you that cat, uh, you that cat Lawrence, or, or I don't know if he said Low or Lawrence. Yeah, cat Low told me about. I said, you know, Richard? And I'm like, oh, no, it's actually Patrick. <laughs> he said, Patrick, oh, that's right. You going to Fat Cat? And I was like, yeah. He said, cool, I'm going too. And then he just started walking. See, I, I, I just started following him. He said, yeah, so he's going, so he going to Fat Cat. So I just walked, I just, just walked him to, to Fat Cat, which was like, you know, two blocks away down the street where like Village Cigars is right outside and then the pizza joint. That was all crazy sketchy in Greenwich Village. So we walked over there and boy, let me tell you something. Roy played, he called, okay. So this is also at that time, right? Where, you know, when you're young, you just, you, you're really just, really like kind of shocked and inspired and really uh impressed that's the better word you're really impressed by fast stuff and super technical stuff and all this kind of stuff whatever but there was always something in me that didn't i was never really just about that i, I it was like a factor right but i never really was just trying to be about that so but roy he went in there he sat down he took his flugel out and he called the lamp is low now i was actually ironically in the process of learning this tune just like a week before this so this must have been like in October or November of 2011. Dang, that was 10 years ago, man. Yeah, it had to be like around October or November 2011. And he pulled out his horn. He called off the tune, played the most beautiful, soulful-ish I ever heard on the trumpet. It, it, it literally makes no sense. And he, it was just right there. He wasn't playing like changes. He wouldn't play whatever. He was, so the, the song is, you know, let me, let me pause it for a little bit. So the song Lampus Low goes B do dee 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 da 
See this? So like, yeah, this tempo, cats want to go. So the baby about to step, the baby about to put it in, the baby about to put it in. They want to do that, and it was just still killing, right? Once you get into it, Roy said, "Ba da da, sco da 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 da, super da ba da 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 da." He went like stuff like that. He just kind of was like, "Side up." I was like, "Yo, let's, bro." It was like the way he played sounded like Shaka Khan singing or like Sade. It sounded like black soul singers, but like trumpet. And that was really the biggest thing that influenced that that just got me. It sounded like he was freaking, <laughs> he was singing through the thing, man. And that was such an important moment for me as a young saxophone player who was constantly surrounded by technique, constantly surrounded by this and that. You know what I mean? Like it was constantly surrounded just by the pressure to just be killing. And then Roy just sat there and just crapped on everybody in there, playing the most soulful stuff ever. So that that's when I was like, yeah, I'm. This is my my hero. <laughs> that was my hero. And so, because I had the ability to play stuff that I was hearing, but I didn't really have the ability to play all the stuff I was hearing because I was trying to go for a bunch of crazy stuff. Then I just started calming down and just playing. You know, I just started playing, trying to sing. And boy, if you, if you want to get out, if you want to learn how to play what you hear, you got to start singing it. You have to start singing it. That's so important. <laughs> I might do a whole little class on that at some point, you know, in the future. But th that's the bottom line, man. Like that, that that's my that's one of my heroes. So all of those people, including there's probably so many other people that I've missed out because I've listened to I listen to a lot of different instrumentalists. Saxophone players actually just like a, a small part of my influence. You know, it's you know, Louis Armstrong too, man. Louis Armstrong, Winton, they they trumpet players have been a huge influence on me and how I play and approach articulation and stuff. Freddie, I listen to a lot of Freddie Hubbard as well. Um, yeah, man. And then bass players, bro. A lot of Paul Chambers, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of Sam Jones, a lot of Ray Brown. Um, yeah, a lot of Ron Carter, bro. I listen to a lot, all, all of them, and I'm just picking it up. Tons of drummers. I'm, I'm more influenced by drummers than probably anybody else. Listen to a lot of Elvin. Listen to a lot of Zooty Singleton, a lot of Sid Catlett, Papa Joe Jones, Philly Joe Jones. Um... Chauncey Morehouse with Big Spider Beck and, and Frankie Trumbauer. He got the beat, man. Check out Chauncey. Chauncey was deep, man. He was one of the few cats, like, non-black musicians that were actually checking out black music back in the day. Like, he was actually one of the few people, man. Like, to be real with you, he was trying to deal with the African drumming in the 1920s and 30s. That's why his beat was so big, and I always felt it. Every time I listened to this music, I'm like, bro, this is hip-hop. <laughs> I was like, yo. I was like, yo, this is... He's not even from New Orleans. He getting in, you know, he getting all up in it like that. So, you know, I, I was very influenced by a lot of different musicians. Um, but yeah, I hope that answers your question. 